Imagine reading curated opinion pieces that aim to help us better understand policy and politics from the people closest to it, or sometimes people who want to be far from it. We offer political insights without the limit of column inches. Introducing quotes by Air Quotes Media, creators of the Hurley, Burley, and Curse of Politics podcasts, where we bring politics from the inside out. And now with quotes, you can read from contributors like Jim Coyle, Jim Stanford, and Kathleen Wynn with more to come. Read quotes at airquotesmedia.com slash quotes. All right. Greetings, you happily miserable accursed. It's Monday morning. It's time for the Curse of Politics. David Hurley here with our political panel, the strategist to give you the goods on what gets decided in the meeting after the meeting. And let's face it, there were a hell of a lot of post-meeting meetings in Ottawa last week. Corey tonight, Jordan Lakenitz and Scott Reed. All right, this week's agenda is full up, like a presidential visit, so let's get right to it. We'll talk about that Biden visit, break the whole thing down from the chocolate bar to Mr. Biden getting a helpful definition of what Her Majesty's loyal opposition is. Speaking of Pierre Polyev, we've said it here before, the guy's clearly got game, a hell of a lot of game. Our cursed clipping is a video piece from Polyev's speech at the For Iran in Solidarity event. We'll break that down and talk about what he's doing right. Then we'll do some budget talk. Federal's coming up, but we also lean into what went down in Ontario last week, Saskatchewan, Alberta's got a budget out there. After all that, we'll hand it over to the great Mr. Pinsent for our hey use. Scott, Corey, Jordan, good weekend. How's the team? Great weekend. Relaxing. Yeah. Great weekend. What was going on? Uh, and nothing particularly special. Just uh, spent some time hanging out with friends here in Ottawa. Uh, uh, made a uh, uh, world famous uh, uh, Tonight family scalloped potatoes last night. Uh, big hit. I love yeah. scalloped potatoes. All, all, all that, uh, all that kind of uh, down homey stuff. I mash potatoes. I mash potatoes. I mash them to death, <laughs> and then I I I saturate them. I just absolutely d day them in butter and salt and milk. And uh, yeah, I don't like scallop. I don't like scallop. I don't like the stuff. I don't like the you know people. Yeah, I'm not. mashed all in way mashed. Yeah. Jordan, I imagine you were ripping it up this weekend. What's your potato preference? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, I kind of like them oven fried, but like, you know, when you sort of mess up the outside of them a little bit, so they get crispy, kind of need the air fryer setting. That's probably my, my preferred potato situation. And I would anybody say, can't go wrong food. with a potato. French fried, home fried, baked, scalloped, yeah. mashed, potatoes, give them to me. Especially with, exactly. especially with toppings, gravy. Oh, good gravy. Or, or put that. them in a pierogi, you know, good. Good prairie oh. uh, approach. All Canadians Fuck can agree on that. <laughs> Fucking yeah. right. Can the highest that. purpose for any potato. Hey, you guys, we're in Ottawa this week for a live taping at the Riddell program at Carleton University. Isn't that going to be a blast? It is. Time. I'm bringing all my friends, so there'll be an extra two people there. <laughs> I, <am Last>. a, <clears throat> I remember a live taping where you brought a bunch of people <clears throat> with T-shirts. That may happen again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sat them in the front row to deliberately intimidate us, uh, and yeah. it, it, it worked. Actually, well, um, I, actually, what I recall about it, Scott, was that it was the last fucking week of the Ontario election. I know, and there were ten people from from PCHQ spending their evening at a Curse of Politics taping. I thought to myself, they think they're in good shape. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Turn, 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 turns out we were, but your skateboards uh, were set to glide. You could spend hours with us, and then I remember at the end of the taping, you know, having a beer milling around the reception, and Corey goes, "Like, uh, should we all go grab dinner?" I'm like, "Do you not need to fucking work?" <laughs> well, uh, I think Jenny might come. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Jen, Jen, Jenny is a, a tentative yes on attending, so you might have a chance to have the, the old band back together uh, for the evening. Well, <clears throat> with the five of us, that would be quite something. We'll be holding court. Be a real party. All right, let's get on to it. You're coming off for dinner, right, Jordan? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so let's get on to it. Those fried potatoes all lined up for you. <laughs> I'm sure you can't Excellent. say no. So President Biden was in town. People may know this, uh, but um, President Biden was in town. Now, I know that I was personally bought off with an invitation to a swanky reception after the dinner that 
makes me a wholly owned subsidiary of the CABC in Canada 2020. But I um, I did think that the visit pretty much was everything the Trudeau government could have wanted. He brought them a gift in the resolution of Roxham Road. Uh, he delivered a piece of stirring oratory in which he extolled the virtues of the Canada-U.S. economic relationship going forward. And he raised no irritants and he delivered no lectures. So it was a tremendously successful visit. I look, looked like to me a home run. And politically, it means a rat's ass. Right, Corey? I, th I think they got something out of it. Like, you know, they, they were on such a bad track with the China stuff and other things. Like, they just couldn't seem to get their groove. And, and I think this kind of hit the reset bu button for them a little bit. I think they... Did, uh, did some smart issues management by uh, jettisoning uh, Handong right before the trip with uh, the, the, the tide of the visit washing that out to sea, um, uh, at least temporarily. It may come back uh, at a later date, but I thought that was pretty adept issues management. Uh, and uh, we all got it wrong in terms of the safe third party agreement. Like I, I would have given them a 1% chance of getting it and, uh, and they delivered. That's a huge win, especially I think in Quebec. Uh, and uh, uh, the rhetoric on Buy America was was dialed way back, um, and uh, you know they didn't get their uh, 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 you know get lectured as you said or or or, or finger wagged at or, around uh, uh, NORAD or uh, or Haiti. Uh, you know all, all things that we predicted. So there you go. Our crystal ball was very foggy. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I saw they did put out some announcements, uh, you know, around the NORAD funding. So I think that the Americans probably felt like they got something out of this whole thing, too. But, you know, they, you know, uh, we, we certainly have uh, uh, given a lot of uh, constructive criticism to the liberals on on uh, uh, their comms in the past. Uh, but you got to got to hand it to them. This week was very good for them. Jordan, do you think it is a channel changer at all? Well, I think it was temporarily a channel changer. I don't think it buys you a long-term respite from the election interference story. And, you know, they're lucky that the budget falls when it does. And so that will eat most of this week. And then things move into the Easter break. So maybe there's a little bit of headroom. But no, I mean, this isn't going to change the channel in the long run. But I agree largely with Corey. I think it was a really positive visit for the prime minister. I think the government team did well to um, to settle any of those irritants behind closed doors. And the Americans were an incredibly light touch, really. If you look at if you look at Biden's remarks and and all of the announcements around the visit, that there's really nothing that was even vaguely critical there. So that's a win. And, you know, it was I think it was really interesting, like. Uh, you know, I attended the speech and and seeing seeing Trudeau next to Biden, uh, ha seeing them speak back to back, you, you know, it is, like Biden is quite an order compared to Trudeau. And I, I think it was it was really interesting to see the folksiness and the dynamism kind of come through. You know, he's he's clearly quite at ease uh, in a way that I think we don't often see the prime minister. So, I, you know, that contrast definitely struck me. I think that the biggest political win for the government out of it is definitely... What do you mean by that, Jordan? Just if I could just push on that. What do you mean by that? Do you think he's more natural, more authentic? Yeah, I think it's, it, it, it comes off as more natural and authentic. And I think, you know, Trudeau's, Trudeau's performance, uh, like, I don't think he's a bad speaker by any means, but he, he has sort of one mode and, you know, often sort of derisively the called the drama teacher uh, mode, right? And... And I think that that sometimes, uh, you know, we've been hearing it now for for two cycles of government. It's it it can be a little flat compared with the somewhat greater tradition of American presidential speeches. Uh, and that contrast was on display uh, on Friday as well. But um, yeah, just to circle back on Roxham Road, I agree. Like that's a big win for the government. I think it's a short term one though because the policy fix that they've come up with isn't isn't, of course, really going to do anything to stem the tide of people seeking to come north. It's just going to make them come in more dangerous places and, and they won't now be tracked by the Canadian government. So I, I don't think that this is a problem by any means that has gone for good, uh, but it has given Trudeau some breathing room on that. 
Um, and I think there's some other stuff that is really, you know, the thing that I found most interesting in this visit, frankly, was what Pierre Polyev did with it. But we're going to have a chance to talk more about that in a bit. Yeah. Got David. David. Does it change the channel for the government? Uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I think it gives them the opportunity. It, it, the, I think the curious thing is whether or not they're going to going to take it. Like, I agree. Um, I actually think that you're being a little um, parsimonious. Like, I actually think that it was uh, pretty good for them politically. Like, I, I think, yes. Sorry, it, I don't want to be parsimonious in my praise. I think they did it perfectly. I said it's an absolute home run of a visit. I just think that the questions this week are going to be about Chinese interference in the House of Commons. Well, that may be, but I think, well, I just, I, I think it was more, I think it was a bigger political um, prize than than maybe you do then. Because okay. I think, first of all, the substance, and I, I, I hear what Jordan is saying with respect to the realities of um, of asylum and complicated immigration policy, but it's a monster political gift, right? To have that irritant, which was a blazing bonfire in Quebec. Yes, yep. they're going to go to more yep. dangerous places, but I think the critical thing is they're going to go to different places, right? And Roxham Road is where you don't want them if you're the prime minister. You want to be really brutally, uncaringly crass about it, right? Like, that's just, he can't have Lego on his ass. He can't afford to be bleeding capital in Quebec. And so that's a monster gift that we didn't predict, and it turns out they've been working on it steadily. I don't know, this. they're much more disciplined than if I'd been in the prime minister's office and I was listening to pundits like us talk about how there was no chance of a deal I would have been like sending DMs going, you just wait, motherfucker. But um, <laughs> they, I, I love for, and, and I also thought, you know, like there's there's what didn't happen, which is nice. You know, you guys talked about no digs and all that sort of stuff. But they also they steered around Haiti. It was like throw some money at policing and just get uh, get off that hook. And that's that's not unimportant. And by the way, that's also it's also a Quebec issue. I mean, you know, the Haiti diaspora is Montreal based. Um, meaning that you're not going to have headaches to you. So we'd gone in there on some mission. It would have turned into a clusterfuck, and that would be hurting him in two years from now if he's trying to go to the election. And that's just complex, uh, complications he didn't need. So I just I thought that there those are genuine political wins in my view. But I thought the biggest gift of all is the gift of example, and it was the speech. And I I'm not like Jordan. I didn't I wasn't seized by uh, Biden's oratory. I, he reminds me of. You know, and I know I'm going to be accused of sounding ageist and I'm being ageist, but like he reminds me of the Boris Karloff monster, you know, like it's kind of like, friend, friend, <laughs> right? You know, like, so it's pretty, pretty clunky. Um, but what he did was not just create a day that was dominated entirely, not by China and interference, but by um substance on the on the deal substance on the on the visit and the pageantry of the visit and all of those kinds of things but that speech was 1000 percent, at least in rhetoric a message of we are going to repatriate critical sectors of our economy we're taking them away from this outshoring trend of the of decades taking them out of china we're bringing them back here to north america and you guys are not only part of that you are absolutely critical to that effort. And maybe that's just sweet talk, but that was that's a real gift. And he over and over and over again put it in the sort of, you know, lunch bucket, working class terms. I thought it was the gift of example. He gave them an opportunity to riff off of it, keep talking about the economy. You got the budget on Tuesday and keep talking about the economy in that way. Keep talking about, you know, good jobs and, you know, growth and manufacturing and I like just keep pounding on like the St. Thomas's, the Oakville's, the Windsor's, right? And all those lunch bucket factory whistle, tie your boots up at the beginning and the end of the day kind of workers. And I just, I thought that was a huge gift. And so to me, the political question is, will the government take hold of that gift? Will it fill today as an example and not just make it a dead day? Will they fill the Monday prior to the budget with something that's similarly, you know, ground level economic. Will they make Tuesday about that? Don't make it about deficit reduction when there's really no fiscal restraint to this budget. I don't want to hear it. It's just a confusing bullshit message. Don't tell people something that they don't believe is true. It just bugs them. Focus instead on jobs and growth, new jobs, good jobs, strong growth, and just focus on that. And, you know, yeah, budgets come and go fast, but 
they can turn that thing into a, into a storyline that lasts five days if you start thinking about it on Thursday night and you stretch that thing to Wednesday or Thursday of the next week. That's five, four, five, six, seven days if they can do it. So that's it. He gave them the gift of example. Fucking take it. Yeah, I think I, I'm I'm interested in in Scott's point because that also struck me is that you know Biden sees industrial policy and the IRA I think in a in a much broader strategic way than we've been having that conversation in Canada in terms of the role of creating good union jobs and and sort of lifting people up along those lines and that's something that we've talked about before as an important path for the government to consider for the budget so I think he really he hit that home. Although there was a really interesting moment in the scrum, and I, I didn't see it reported widely, where Biden sort of slipped a little bit and, and said, well, you know, this works out well, because of course, Canada has the raw resources, and you don't really want to upgrade them, but we do. And so that, you know, there's a, I think that there's like a bit of a cautionary note. Send them there. logs down the river. <laughs> Let's do it. it. Exactly. We got the mill. <laughs> You know, uh, like whether we want to continue to be the branch plant on this stuff, even with like a greener, a greener cover is something that the Canadian government is still has to have that conversation with Americans. But they also have to be clear in their own policies uh, and their own approach and their response to the IRA that we we do have, a, you know, we do have a role in the value added chain there. So that's something that I'll be looking for in the budget as well. I don't know if I heard a phrase before earlier in my life than hewers of wood and drawers of water. Okay. Yeah. To describe Canada. Go ahead. Miners of critical minerals. Maybe it doesn't roll off the tongue <laughs> well, right. quite the same way. Well, okay. Like in both the provinces and the federal government have been talking about our desire to make sure that we're doing the the processing of those critical minerals in Canada. And we want to do that. But, you know, it, it's it, fairness is a two way street in terms of free trade. And it, it could be that some of that ends up being done in the United States, too. And, you know, um, so be it. You know, at the end of the day, uh, having an integrated North American supply chain is is in all of our interest, and I and I think that came across uh, loud and clear from the president. Let's hope that uh, that that continues, and that you know both sides of uh, of the border aren't throwing up uh, barriers or or uh, creating irritants around it. Because I I do think I do think the strategy is the correct one, and and we will do better if we work together on it. Hey, David, can so, I make two yeah, more go ahead. I yeah, just want to make two little tiny random points. One is just to reinforce something that Jordan said. Like I, I, I really mean it when I talk about the gift of example because I think that you know when for the last four weeks as we've been trying to get this VW deal landed, which Corey's been so involved in and thinking about and all that. When you hear our government, fifteen talk, billion dollars. Oh God, <laughs> that that that's you want fries with that. Like, Jesus listen, man, Christ. we're going to be spilling. Well, it's, like, it's, it's we didn't have a debate more, about corporate. No. We, did, we haven't had a debate about corporate uh, welfare, but let me tell <laughs> you, it's 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 going to be a an issue that we have to confront down the road for sure. But but what I was going to say is that you know Biden Biden really made it about knocking the rust off of Cleveland and Pennsylvania, like you know, shining up and re and buffing up the the the, the machinery of the. Rust Belt and 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 making it chrome again, and I thought, you know, that's a real blinking sign because when we hear our ministers talking about it and the prime minister, we talk about it through that lens of the professional class. We talk about it like management consultants who have been brought in to analyze, you know, how we rewire this, and it's they'll make the phonetical sounds of jobs and growth, but it doesn't seem like that's what's motivating it, and. Um, and everyone wants to sound like they're the smartest person receiving their briefing, right? Like it's all people talking, they slide into jargon about, you know, critical minerals and all this kind of shit. So I thought that was a good example. The second thing is just a general note on presidential visits. I get a little tired of the way we cover them. Like we're so fucking insecure. It's always like, oh, well, did the president slide us in this way? Or will we slide in that way? We don't really matter. Oh my God, he reduced his, he's only going to stay overnight. He made overnight. a leaf he's joke. Oh stay. my God, he's so funny. He made a leaf joke. I know, and oh we just get God. so uptight and there's but, no changing it, but Jesus fucking Christ, well, it, it just it, seems so provincial and little. Like, let's just, let's just report it straight. Violent windstorms. Wildfires, atmospheric rivers, the march of COVID worldwide. We've talked about all of it here the last number of weeks. More specifically, how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, pulls out all the stops to keep people connected when these natural disasters threaten that connectivity. TELUS has resilience and reliability coded into their company DNA in two distinct strands. One, 
They invest billions to build differently than their competitors. And two, they act differently, going above and beyond to keep us connected in the most extreme circumstances. What's the phrase? Controlling the controllables. Seems to me that's exactly what TELUS works hard to do. But there is a challenge to network reliability that has nothing to do with anything the natural world might produce. In fact, it's entirely the product of human behavior and more than a little onerous to control. Cable theft and the vandalism of network infrastructure. Geez, that sounds a bit anodyne, so let me be more descriptive. People are out there slicing into network cables in search of copper wire and then stealing the metal, which they resell. Now, you might recall TELUS has largely upgraded to much stronger and durable fiber optic cables, replacing the older copper. But a cable still looks like a cable. Thieves don't figure that out until they've already cut into it. By then, the damage is done, and there's danger. To the thieves who come into direct contact with live cables, to first responders called to the scene, to technicians who restore service, and to the communities who temporarily lose connectivity to essential services and loved ones. Curly Burleyites, 44% of all TELUS major outages due to cable damage since 2015 are the result of thieves on the hunt for copper. This kind of human threat to network resilience and reliability? It's a hell of a challenge to control for. But TELUS is investing in things like drone surveillance and predictive software to prevent the impacts of theft. Taking other measures, too. They're up for it. Well, I was uh, was in uh, D.C. what a couple of weeks ago, and the Irish Prime Minister was in town uh, for uh, St. Patrick's Day and a big to do and all of that. Way more press on Little Ireland's Prime Minister visiting uh, the United States uh, than you saw in the U.S. media around Biden coming up here. And I, I think it, you know, um, so yeah, to your point, Scott, I think that's right. We're you know we're the little brother in this uh, in this sibling relationship, and we spend a lot more time. Uh, thinking about and wondering what you know, the, our big brother thinks about us and how they're feeling about us than and the other way around. Like it's just it's always been there. You know, there's it, it's not the most Scary. flattering national. Do they take uh, us seriously? Are they thinking about us? Do we really matter? Yeah. Are they just yeah, saying yeah, we matter? Yeah. Do we really yeah. matter? Oh my God. Is she gonna call me? I think I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> check my messages. Is she called me? <laughs> so Fuck. let me say let me say two things and see what you folks think about this. First of all, and the, the springboard off what you've just been saying. First of all, Biden is in many respects bookending Bill Clinton. Because Clinton was the Democrat that went into Cleveland and those Rust Belt places and said, globalization's a fact, your jobs are over, your life's never going to be the same, and the, our job is to find you a job as an investment dealer in uh, fucking Manhattan or something. Um, and Biden has come back full circle and said, actually, we're bringing those jobs back. Globalization's not a reality. It's a policy decision. And we're bringing those jobs back. So it's very interesting. He's talking in a way that no Democrat has talked in over 30 years um, about the economy. But the second thing is, and this pertains to our government, which is he talks, he doesn't talk about climate change. He talks about jobs. So all the things, to your point, Scott, about a narrow focus on jobs, all the investments that he makes to reduce emissions are portrayed as job-creating plans and sold that way. So I don't hear him talking about how close they are to net zero by 2050 or anything like that. And the Canadian message is different. The Canadian message is about climate change. <clears throat> and that message has embedded within it notions of sacrifice and pain and just transitions and things that are frightening. Biden doesn't want to frighten anybody about climate change. It's all a win-win. Okay. Yeah, very much so. But if if you look at what their actual policy is, uh, Biden and and Brad Wall have a lot more in common than uh, than Biden and, and Justin Trudeau in terms of the approach. almost identical. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing to bear in mind is that you know to go 
to go to the Inflation Reduction Act, like what Biden's doing there is not like it is massive climate policy. It's massive industrial policy. But baked into it is also huge affordability things like huge sort of social justice and equity pieces. They were created right in into the, into that legislation and into that push. And I think that the jobs focus comes like flows quite honestly out of that and that they approached this top to bottom with those with those things in mind, like that this was not going to just be a flat economic policy. This is going to be something much more than that. And I think the risk in Canada sort of as the government thinks about how to respond to the Inflation Reduction Act is that if it gets reduced to a conversation about which tax credits we need to tit for tat on that, then then they're going to lose really what the, the political wins are and the, and the political power of the IRA uh, and what that response could look like. Well, well, maybe, but like, I think, you know, the, the, the jury is going to be out on that. Like, we have to see how many of these uh, promised facilities actually come to happen. Like VW looks like that's all, all taken care of. We'll see what happens with Stellantis. But, you know, how many of these projects are going to be visibly underway by the time the next election happens? So if you're in the Windsor area and you see, you know, stuff going up all around you, you know, you're going to feel a lot better about the government than, than if it's just, you know, uh, still at the press releases and uh, uh, talking about it phase. So like I, I, th you know, but over time, yes, I think all this stuff's going to happen. It'll be largely good. It's just how much of it can actually happen before the election campaign that is, you know, visible and, and being experienced by folks. You know, David, to your point, I agree with all that, but to your, I, I really agree with that point. And I'm not, I'm not sure that Polyev has actually played his cards yet on where he's going to be on all of this, whether he's deciding that he's going to jive the government and say, wait a second, you're squandering t uh, tens of billions of dollars on jobs that may or may not come and are awfully goddamn expensive, by the way. Um, or if he's going to get uh, behind this and um, and not make it a point of conflict. But you're, what you and Jordan are talking about, David, I think is really interesting. And to me, there's a fundamental political communication lesson in there. And there's a, a choice, which is you don't have to tell everybody about everything you do, right, as long as you're doing it. And I know that people will condemn this as sinister and cynical and manipulative, but you know, like Biden doesn't talk about all the equity and identity stuff that's built in there, right? Like he doesn't celebrate it. Now, you know, when he goes before, you know, the Democratic caucus and is getting pulled and stuff, I'm sure that he plays those cards and points those things out. But when he's doing the broad sale, he doesn't he doesn't do these things. And to your credit, to be honest, um, Corey, the Ford government is uh, uh, plays this very strong, too. It doesn't it does things, but it doesn't necessarily put everything in the window. It places the emphasis on what it wants, where it thinks there's a broad public consensus or at least a winnable consensus. And then, you know, it doesn't necessarily uh, trumpet those other things. And in the case of our, you know, the federal government, the liberals, they are, they, they feel almost, it seems, David, like they're sometimes compelled to say, but we want it. We want you to understand this 1.5 degrees centigrade thing. And we want you to understand that we understand it and then we're doing this and that we're not just doing it, but that we're right. We're right to do it. So park your doubts and, and agree with us. And my view is just take the fucking win, you know, like talk about the jobs, talk about new uh, opportunities, talk about new growth. And then when like you're getting, you know, pounded by you, you can't talk double about track the economic right. benefits or talk about so the environmental benefits. So what you're really saying is put the climate change on the back burner rhetorically. Yes. And bring jobs forward, rhetorically. I've always felt that. I mean, mm. I don't think, I'm, I just don't well, Not just jobs. I think it's infrastructure, too. Like, I think there's a bunch it's of stuff. Industrial like, policy, I'll, growth, I'll, all that stuff. I'll be very interested to see where the, the federal liberals come down on things like the 413 highway, which uh, is massively popular in uh, the 905 belt and more controversial and divisive within the 416. But, like, that kind of infrastructure stuff, big, th those will be big issues, too. And, you know, uh, we talked about that largely as, as you know, have a, a, a project uh, with environmental benefits where you're not sitting in gridlock all day is is better from a from an emission standpoint. Uh, you know, so there are ways that they could they could fit some of these things into their agenda. I'll be interested to see to what extent they, they talk about that. Uh, you know, it, uh, I do think the election is going to be decided largely in Ontario. Uh, next time, uh, they are partners on a number of projects there, whether it's uh, the Ontario line uh, on the subway side. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things there that are are beyond just the you know reindustrialization of southwestern Ontario that are are going to be huge drivers of growth and, and employment. Remember the Velveeta ads? 
Some of us do. They'd pop up on evening TV shows back in the days of mass appointment viewing. A ripe voice narrator would talk over pictures of a happy mom in the kitchen, narrating all sorts of bizarre recipes in which the central ingredient was Velveeta cream cheese. So weird. The ads were a hilarious part of the 60s and 70s zeitgeist in Canada, and now, of course, they're gone. The reason anyone watched them at all back then was choice or lack of it. Audiences were more captive. In some parts of the country, there was only one channel. Certainly nothing was on demand. It was just a different world. Actually, lack of choice back in those days determined quality of life for whole swaths of the population. Prairie grain farmers were often effectively bound to a single shipping company and a single railroad to move their crop. It was monopolistic. Farmers would load up their three-ton grain truck day after day, heading off to the nearest wooden grain elevator and paying whatever they were charged. It was just the way it was. To put it mildly, all that has changed. The three-ton truck and ubiquitous wooden elevators have faded into history, replaced by high-throughput grain handling hubs and the Super B truck, which can haul up to 42 tons of grain at a time. The Super B has a longer range, meaning farmers get to choose where they'll sell their crop and to whom. And because of that, farmers now get to choose their railroad too. A single company no longer dominates entire rural economies. Our sponsor, CN, is a vigorous contender in this world of choice. It competes hard for agribusiness. CN's prime directive is punctuality. Its trains leave on time, arrive on time, and deliver cargo smoothly and safely. It has set records this year for grain shipments. To be clear, the reality of 2023 is competition. And competition, as opposed to more regulation, elevates everyone. Praise be and pass the cream cheese. All right. <clears throat> Jordan mentioned Pierre Poiliev. Let's talk about him. Uh, I stumbled across a video of him this weekend uh, speaking at a big hockey arena to a large group of Iranian nationals um, about, uh, about the Iranian presence in Canada. And I was just really taken by his presentation, how the crowd was reacting to him. Let's take a minute and watch this. A former police chief from Tehran was seen in a gym, exercising, frolicking about, enjoying the freedom of our land, even after years of robbing others of their freedom. This must never be a safe haven for tyrants or their enablers. lock arms with the courageous ones on the ground. What are they doing now? They are jumping over the fire. The act of jumping over the fire symbolizes purifying one of all of the poisons of the past, but it involves taking a risk. When you are in the air over the fire, you are taking a big risk. You might get burned. And so many courageous young people have been burned as they took the risk, the risk of their lives to fight for the freedoms of others. And if they are going to take this risk to purify of the poisons of this regime in order to be enveloped in the warmth of spring, we must take the risk. We must jump over the fire with them. We must join with them in their efforts to bring about freedom and liberty, women, life, freedom. So I I saw that clip and I tweeted it out and I had a, a reference. I just said, hey, liberals, this guy's got game. And I do it because I, I sense a complacency um, among people that are on Twitter and see him 
you know, uh, meeting with strange people and lib- and progressives mocking him for his, the people he associates with and stuff. And there's, I think there's a temptation to see him as somebody who can't be elected, as somebody who's not good enough, who's too too weird, too extreme, too out of the mainstream of Canadian politics, too uh, whatever the hell it is that people are thinking. And, you know, I just want people to understand that out there, this stuff is going on. And he's connecting with people. And he doesn't look to me like a crazy extremist there. He looks like a leader. Yeah. Well, like, look, I, I, it, and it's not just ethnic events like this, but like that one is very striking. And you see the amount of enthusiasm in the crowd. Uh, but I was, you know, we talked about a, was it three or four weeks ago about having 1,700 people at a rally in Windsor. Um, and look, we, we did very well in Windsor provincially. We never had 1700 people at a rally. Uh, you know, he is, uh, he is getting momentum. I think there's, I don't know, a couple of things that I would say, uh, around this for, for any leader, but especially opposition leaders, you're better to be not in the house of commons, uh, nattering away at question period, you know, maybe a couple of days a week you do do that. Uh, but you're better to be out doing things like this. You're better to be out, uh, you know, meeting people, uh, having them have a, an experience with you where you can communicate directly one on one to be uh, to be essentially campaigning. And, uh, you know, and we talked a little bit about China. We're not going to get into it a bunch today, but I would put that as a list of, you know, Ottawa issues that uh, tend to dominate question period, but tend not to be voting issues for, for most of the electorate. Uh, so you know you're better to be out on the road doing this kind of stuff, whether it's talking to folks at a union hall or whether it's talking to uh, to Iranians who are who who are you know putting their lives on the line to try to to bring uh, democracy to that country. Yeah, I mean, this is I think a continuation of a conversation that we've had many times about the the danger of Pierre Polyev and the danger of complicity and to be baffled as to why the Liberals are making no discernible moves to put forward any opposition, research, any negatives, any contrast piece at all on him. I think it's a, it's a massive mistake and the time is just going by, right? And, and He is defining himself before me. they get a chance to define him. Yeah, well, I mean, and and ongoing, right? Like, so, so I I think that 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 can you know, and 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 I hear as well, you know, New Democrats are worried about that, and and we've already seen that the you know they they've gone out and done some negative pieces on him where the Liberals haven't, which is a you know I think a fascinating dynamic, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of that in the weeks and months to come if the Liberals continue to for whatever reason stall on. On this, I think on on you know on this issue specifically with the Iranian community, you know I think I think his oratory is is good here. Certainly, um, you know the the there's a there's a strong penchant for poetry there, and he he seized on it. So kudos to whichever staffer uh, helped draft that speech. It really it really hit with the crowd. Um, you know, to put it in perspective, though, I think that there's two maybe three seats in play in Toronto f- for that vote, and you know Thornhill will stay Tory, Willowdale will stay Liberal. And maybe Richmond Hill might be a toss up. But I, I mean, the, you know, the Union Hall in Windsor, like this is this is real stuff. Um, but, you know, if we look at the public domain polls that have been out over the last few weeks, and if we kind of track what's been happening since the New Year's, there's a really interesting tension happening for the Conservatives right now. So they are somewhat stalling out with centrist voters, you know, even though they have a small edge, they they don't seem to be growing much within that. And they're still, they still appear vulnerable to the PPC, like they're, you know, depending on which, uh, which polls you look at, they are sometimes dropping folks off to that side. So they're caught, I think, in, in a, in a bit of a worst of both worlds scenario, where they're having to uh, do things to help hold on onto that PPC vote, and yet they're not really growing uh, within that centrist vote. So that's that that's going to continue to be their conundrum. And then just the last thing I would want to say is that with respect to the Biden visit, I was fascinated that that the one issue that, you know, of course, other than the his passionate uh, love of the loyal official opposition role that he that he raised with Biden was vaccine passports. Um, you know, and as 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 you well, you know, well before Corey and I joined the podcast and discussed with like this is a this is a 90-10 split. This is not something that is really an issue for the majority of Canadians. 
Fred and- Delory. Fred Delory on the Hurley Burley last week said unequivocally it cost them the 2021 election. Yeah, well, I mean, the the math is not in your favor, right? But which and and of course, Jenny knows that very, very well, and which makes it all the more interesting that that was chosen as the one issue that he was going to raise with Biden and that they were going to push out. And if you look back over at some of the other things he's been doing over the last few weeks. We're seeing more engagement on the Jordan Peterson stuff. We're seeing more stuff on drug policy. Um, You know, so there's a, there's obviously a real move there to try to regain some of those soft PPC folks. uh, But at what cost to his potential with centrist voters? So I thought that was a really interesting dynamic. And oh, and maybe the last thing I'll say, it was really dumb when Biden Biden had to call out the Tories during the speech for not applauding the uh, gender uh, equal cabinets. That was not good. Mm. Not a good look. So these last couple of years, there was this thing we couldn't stop talking about. A thing that was materially affecting how we lived our lives. Supply chains. Come on, it was on your lips nearly every day. Today, that thing is inflation. The two are linked Choked supply chains aren't the only cause of inflation, but they're a factor. The result? That sick feeling when we look at the price of fruit or fish or the cost of supplies to run our businesses. So we need to take advantage of every opportunity to stabilize costs and create greater affordability for Canadians. One big opportunity is Roberts Bank Terminal 2, the new shipping container terminal proposed for the Port of Vancouver. Our sponsor, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, has the right plan for building it. It's a critical link for Canada's supply chains because, one, we desperately need more container capacity so our trade goods move as efficiently as possible, and two, because it'll bring healthy competition to the Pacific Gateway. Competition, as you know, typically spurs competitive pricing. More choice, more terminal operators, create more options for businesses to help lower the cost of products Canadians rely on. Lower costs. How badly do we need that, eh? Not just now, but always. Why is the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority the one to do it? They have a proven track record of building sustainable infrastructure projects, and they're a trusted partner of government, business, Indigenous groups, and local communities to get the job done. Scott, you must be sanguine about all this. Uh, sanguine. Is that like, I taste like wine and ginger ale? Is that what that means? Um, uh, fruit. Fruit. I, um, I, think, I think I'm going to zag on you guys a bit. Um, I mean, you know, I've been emphatic for months that I think maybe a year, that I think uh, the liberals ought to be pounding and defining him and going hard and, 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 making certain that everyone sees uh, Pierre Polyev's greatest hits of weirdness. Um, So I continue to emphatically believe that. And I grant that this video demonstrates his ability to connect with a crowd, to draw a crowd, to deliver when a crowd is set, as this one was, all of those things. Um, But there's still, uh, I think this video still has clues about how you can uh get at this guy and where uh some of his deficiencies are like i to my mind as much as he's connecting with this crowd it's still a little too angry still a little too ideological still much much too little empathy for my taste like i think what this guy really really needs is to be seen in front of an audience um demonstrating empathy and you know um, I, 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 it just, and yes, there's obviously his presence there and his echoing there, um, the crowd's anxiety and, and, and outrage. Yes, that obviously there's an empathetic, um, element to it, but it was delivered with a little bit of let's go get them. Also from an ideological standpoint, he, he really is a Reagan Republican in some ways. And I don't mean that in terms of the continuum of where we are in populist politics, but a lot like he literally sometimes sounds like a soundtrack from the Reagan years. And this sounded like a soundtrack from the Reagan years. It sounded like, you know, and, you know, and the issue perhaps begets that, but, you know, you see that that's where his, his reflex is when he talks about tax and spend. And he talks about, he talks about these divides around the sort of the ideological tones of like a young Roger Stone did. And it's kind of like sort of, you know, you can detect it if you're really steeped in politics and it's interesting. Last thing I would say is I wonder about 
all the things that Jordan listed off. I, I wonder if as much as I'm damning on the on the liberals for not going harder at this guy and um, and seeking to define him, I wonder if there's a little bit of uh, hubris creeping in uh, to the conservatives. I wonder if there's a little bit of them starting to believe their own bullshit. Uh, you know, like I see some of these issues, there's a little bit of self-indulgence. I didn't think that it was just like, maybe it's a strategic play with the PPC. I thought it was just plain fucking weird to focus on vaccine passports with Biden's visit. I thought it was just a flat out strange choice. And you can tell me that maybe they're bleeding support and that's a way to fortify it, an easy play. Uh, it makes no sense to me. I don't, it does. I just don't think it makes sense. And I just think you see indications on issues they're picking and their manner, even that weird handshake thing. Like there's a little bit of kind of like, hi, I carried my briefcase to grade 10 uh, science. And I'm like, you know, I was sent here from model parliament. Yes, I am the loyal opposition leader. We are loyal here. It's like, fuck, okay, gear down, you know, <laughs> um, just, you know, like literally like, uh, so I just think I, I, like, I, Yes, the emphatic broad point is the guy has game. The guy has all the natural advantages. There's a huge desire for change building and dissatisfaction, all those kinds of things. The liberals feel lumpy. Trudeau was bruised, all kinds of problems. I, I, but I also see little signs, it seems to me, that I think the conservatives are sort of like, you know what, we can afford to believe what we want to believe because uh, this thing's rolling for us. And, uh, and I, I think you know, if I'm right, then they're going to have, they also are going to have to be more disciplined. Yeah. And can I just say that Maud Parle is a really great way to describe Pierre Polyev's energy over the last week? Well, I, I, I like to draw a little contrast between these town halls uh, that uh, the Trudeau has been doing, which remind me a lot of, of the worst of the 2015 campaign for the Conservatives, where you have these small audiences that are clearly highly curated, uh, so that uh, there aren't any protesters or any disruptions, but where you look like you're just talking to a very small, narrow group of folks that are already in your tent. And, uh, you know, uh, like it or, 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 or don't like it, uh, you know, Polyev's events are wide open, they're large audience, uh, they, they far more resemble what Trudeau was doing in 2015, and Trudeau now resembles what Harper was doing in 2015. There has been a big change, I think, in the way that they're doing these sorts of, of uh, uh, political events. And, and I assume how they'll be campaigning. And, you know, part of that is like, Don't you think that that's a bit of a natural evolution, like as, as yeah, governments I, I, age? And, well, you know, that doesn't yeah. seem that odd well, to me. Well, there's well, another okay, element but, to it, though. All right, but, all right, but like, yeah, I, I, you know, if, if you're saying that there's natural evolution and that you, you know, your em enemies are accumulating to the point where uh, you have to uh, to really police your events very tightly in order to not have them disrupted. Yeah, I think that often happens. But like, this is part of the reason why governments end up losing. Uh, you know, you're you're not in outreach mode. You're in in play it safe mode uh, in terms of who you're going and talking to. So, you know, I. I Look, I, I agree with some of the things on tone, Scott. You know, I, I, I think, you know, uh, I wouldn't have brought up vaccine passports. I, I, I personally wouldn't be worried about losing votes to the PPC. You know, if, uh, if that was really going to be a thing, uh, Ford would have uh, had a much different electoral outcome. And, you know, uh, let's face it, you know, the provinces were the ones who were having to, to use the iron fist uh, in terms of lockdown measures, et cetera. Like if that was going to manifest itself within a conservative voter coalition in an election, it probably would have come after uh, uh, after Ford in the last election. We didn't see it. That vote eventually just found its way back home. That that which you know was there, and and you know the three four percent of people who who stayed there were you know as many of them were Green Party supporters as former Conservative supporters. So. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be that worried about it if I were them. But you know, I think yeah. I mean, I obviously the, don't know that. I obviously don't know the PPC vote as well as the poly F people do. But I would be um, I would be tempted to treat it like liberals treat the NDP, which is we're going to be able to collapse this thing at the end of the campaign. Yeah. They hate yeah, Trudeau. Yeah. They hate Trudeau more than they hate anything in the world. So the prospect of beating him surely will be compelling enough to. Yeah, get but those it votes. seems like their strategic decisions are pointing the opposite direction. They seem very worried about the mm. PPC vote. Well, I, it's, they agree with some elements of that, and so they're campaigning on it because it's coming from a heartfelt belief place in the in the case of, of Polyev, and I think there's some truth to that. Like, I think, you know, I think that that that's how he feels on some of these issues. So, 
you know, I, I think that's going to be reflected sometimes in what he says, but I, I don't, I, you know, I think, you know, it's a weird choice to bring up with, uh, with, um, uh, the president, however, uh, I don't think uh, these visits ever really do much for opposition leaders anyway. Like the, the share of voice in those stories was almost non-existent for the opposition. Can I just throw in two cents on town halls? Because this is like a this is a, a pet peeve of mine as a comms guy that I've had for a long time. I think, you know, the, the town hall setting, particularly for an incumbent politician, it's like it's it's like Diet Coke. You know, you think you, you drink it, you think it's going to make you lose weight. It doesn't. OK, like you go to you do town halls, you think it's going to like it's going to make you popular. It doesn't. Right. If town halls were an effective mechanism for political communication, right, Michael Ignatiev would have won the election and he didn't. You know, rise up, rise up, rise up, rise rise up. up. Rise and, and up. I, you know, like if you want to use them, if you're Trudeau and you're like, let's get our asses out of Ottawa and let's. Let's, you know, let's get a sparring partner for the for the PM. So let's get him in a couple town halls just so he gets some of those like, you know, the you know, the left hook and the and the right cross back. OK, great. But if you're actually fooling yourself into thinking that that is like a, a, a winning representation and, and and vehicle for uh for you, like it's it's not these things. They're a mirage. Like I say, it's like Diet yeah, Coke. I think, I think they one, do of play dumber, an important role one of the dumber things I ever did was yeah. late in late in Kathleen's term encouraged her to go on a cross province tour of town halls which were completely open to the public for the express purpose of having her seen to be strong and taking these things on and arguing her case rather than retreating to the bunker in uh, in uh, Queens Park and I to be honest I think all they did was reinforce the notion that she was unpopular I mean, there's a myth about them. There's a myth that right. started in 1979 with Pierre Trudeau, the gunslinger campaign. And the myth is that those things hone your skills. People see how strong and tough you are. And then that wins you elections. And and he won the 80 election after Joe Clark decided to chew a grenade. He didn't win the 79 election. And it just doesn't I, I, I just I, like I say, if you're using it to sort of just tune up quick, fine but to believe your own bullshit to think that those things are actually a, a vehicle they're they're not i mean my sense is they're using it for a tune-up and i do think that's a that's a valid purpose for them especially in a second term when your guy's getting more and more insular but you're right that you know particularly in the highly controlled ones sometimes the optics can be worse they can be they can reinforce the notion that you that your your guy's surrounded by a bubble and then you get, people. then you get the ones where like the the crowd is so familiar that they start referring to each other by first name, not because they're actually skilled politicians, but because they actually know each other, right? It's like, hey, Rhonda, oh, and then, and then Rhonda says, hey, you know, like when you, you know, when you 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 came to my house in 2015 and we had coffee, um, you know, my uh, my brother got uh, my brother got his uh, electrician certificate. Thanks for that, by the way. Like, you know, it gets it's like, come on, just yeah, I'm not a big fan. Your lights, your fancy whirring toothbrush, your coffee maker, home alarm, computer, the internet, bread maker, bubbles in your water maker, that thing intermittently going beep in your house you're still trying to locate, the EV you drive now, or the EV you will be driving in the future. Because you're all smart people, I know you've caught on to the common piece here. All these things need electricity to operate. Now multiply your electricity needs by the needs of 99.9% .9 of everybody else. This is the reason why we need an always-on source of electricity. One that's dependable and clean, producing zero climate change GHG emissions. I'm talking about nuclear power. I want to underline this. Nuclear power is the clean energy technology we need to get to net zero. It's already producing more than half of Ontario's electricity, helping us decarbonize at precisely this moment, as you hear these words through your electronic device. How? It provides the dependable, consistent baseload of clean electricity that works hand in hand with and enables the contributions of wind and solar. What that means is it's the essential part of getting us to net zero and our clean energy future. Remember, the wind's got to blow to move those turbines, and the sun doesn't shine all the time. Natural gas? The single biggest misconception out there is that natural means clean. It doesn't. It's methane, a greenhouse gas. The point is this. 
Nuclear energy is a solution to climate change that's already here. In Canada, our own can-do reactors have been producing it safely for 70 years. Our newest sponsor is the Nuclear Innovation Institute. They know that energy dependability and clean energy are a public good, and that for our coffee makers, computers, and one day all of our electric cars to work, Canada needs more nuclear power. Stay tuned. In the coming weeks, we'll be talking more about this and how it benefits all Canadians. Or go to nii.ca slash nuclear now to learn more. All right, let's move on very quickly to budgets. There's Budgets are in the air in Canada. We've got a federal one coming out tomorrow. We had Ontario and Saskatchewan last week. We've got an Alberta budget that's aging like an $8 bottle of wine uh, out there. Um, one of the things that's, I think, intriguing in, in leapfrogging off the Alberta thing is that while Freeland may be talking about restraint, there isn't much evidence of any restraint going on in the country. I don't think we're going to see any in the federal budget. But, you know, I mean, the Alberta budget I mentioned is is frankly a big spending budget that's based on revenue projections that now look very, very dodgy based on the price of oil. Um, and uh, and the, the Ontario budget was, well, the biggest spending budget in Ontario history. I saw Peter Bethan Falvey on TV, and underneath that was that that line, the biggest spending budget in Ontario history. And I know Peter, and I thought, my God, he must be proud of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot in that budget he should be proud of because, you know, it's really a story of revenue growth in a lot of these provincial budgets. Now, it's a different situation in Alberta because of, uh, of uh, resource revenues, but... Uh, uh, but and I think we'll see it in the federal budget uh, uh, this week as well. Revenues are way up, like, and uh, and that's you know that's in, invariably going to be good news for incumbents. Yeah, but it's an inflation bonus. It doesn't last. It's an infla- yeah, sure, it's an inflation doesn't bonus. Need to. But but it's uh, uh, look, uh, you know, we'll talk more about the provincial one in my hey you, but. Uh, like, look, uh, there's a very clear path to balance, and uh, I think there's actually a case to be made that you know the balance, uh, you know, the Ontario budget may be balanced uh, this year. Uh, For fucking just, sure, uh, it is. You guys, <laughs> uh, Jesus Christ, you had to throw money in by, by barrels into Ubers as they drove by. Well, well, for declaring well, there, balance. There, Give me yeah, a break. There are, some, there, there are some big things though that are contingent to, out there, like uh, you know, Bill One Twenty Four on public sector wages. So there's, there's a lot of big uh, uh, public sector contracts coming up. There's some big lawsuits and things uh, that that may need to be settled. So. You know, time will tell, but, you know, all of that to be said, you know, I, there is a there is a good revenue growth story in almost every province uh, in the country right now, which is which is not a bad thing. And as I say, it's going to lean that that's a bonus for incumbents. They're the ones who get to to uh, allocate that money and and to uh, get the kudos for for having a you know, pretty good f- fiscal situation in most cases. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to see a very interesting budget. A lot of it's already out. I see the, the, the feds are talking about a grocery subsidy, which is just sort of an enhancement of the GST rebate. Uh, but uh, got some good news out of the healthcare stuff. That'll be a big component. Uh, there's a bunch of money that's, uh, that, that's going to provinces in that space. Um, you know, and then, and as we've talked about, meeting IRA, it's a big commitment. So, you know, we'll you know we'll see what other surprises come out and talk about them on Thursday uh, at our live broadcast. But um, you know, there it feels like they're only really starting to get some budget messaging out now. You know, post Biden trip, uh, it's not as long a rollout as as I think uh, any of us would ever recommend. I think you want to spread that out over a longer period of time. But you know, things have been such with the the China uh, uh, election interference story. I. I'm not sure if they tried to get it out, whether it would have got any traction anyway. Hey, Scott, I'm going to put you on the spot. The first question in Wednesday's question period, is it about the budget or not? Yeah, I wouldn't make it about the budget. No, I'm asking you to predict. Not what you would do. I'm asking you to predict. Will the first question on Wednesday be about the budget or not? Yes, because I do think I I do think that is established in as as. As rewarding as the Chinese interference uh, story has been for the conservatives in terms of destabilizing the government and, you know, they just kind of, you know, look, bounce into every 
corner and walk into every wall and door. Um, at some point, you got to get back to bread and butter economic issues. And I think that there's going to be an opportunity for them to do that. And if I were the Conservatives, I'd want to I'd want to punch holes in it. All right. And what do you think is going to be the vulnerability based on what you know? Well, I, you know, I think they'll just go back to like your answer to everything is spend. And I, 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 I think say that without taking ownership of, you know, what things they would particularly cut. But I would just say, you know, your answer is always spend, spend, spend. And, you know, we ought to be doing more for small business as an example and yada, yada, yada. And, um, and I, I, I think they'll pound away on that and just say, these guys are not like, I would just sort of work on the brand value of they're not sound managers of the economy and the purse. And, you know, you know, that's kind of generally where polls are at. And so I would just pound away on that theme if I have the conservatives. For the liberals, uh, you know, I, I really only have one thing to say, and that is I would just like, just stop competing with yourself. Like I just, like, you know, this complicated multivariate message about what the budget is. On the one hand, it's about fiscal restraint and how notwithstanding healthcare, childcare, pharmacare, dental care, uh, elder care, notwithstanding the massive investments in the IRA, notwithstanding the uh, rebates that we're going to give to fight inflation and make certain that we help people with the cost of living, and notwithstanding the squillions of dollars that will also be going towards, you know, uh, climate. Um, this is a fiscally responsible, constrained budget. Just don't, don't, don't waste my time. Okay, just focus on growth. Take the message that Biden gave you. And in the phraseology and framing that he gave it to you, jobs and whole, whole industries, right? Like talk about the fact that we are growing plants, like use the word plant. People will be able to go to the plant. They'll be hiring a third line. People will be working midnights again because the plant will be there. It isn't just something that got you know, mothballed and moved away to Asia. Like talk in those terms and say that you're securing those jobs. Those plants, those places of, you know, eight hour shift works, like do that, hammer on it. Don't make it about anything else. Job, good jobs, strong growth. Good jobs, strong growth. Just hammer on that. Hey, Jordan. Well, what, 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 sorry, go ahead. Jordan, why does Biden feel more comfortable using the word union and promoting union jobs than any politicians in Canada do? Did you guys, sorry to jump in, did you notice that that one point, uh, I think it was in their newser, it was in the newser, where Biden went on a run and talked about union jobs, union jobs, union jobs, and then the, they went to the prime minister and he said, yes, union jobs, well, good working middle class jobs. Like he switched the vernacular explicitly right there in that moment. I thought that was a fascinating little insight as to how they run this through the universal translator. Well, Ford, 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 talks, yeah. Ford, Ford talks about union jobs. Well, so, yeah, and I mean, but... I think Biden knows where his bread is buttered on this stuff, right? And and there is, you know, the the Liberal Party generally, you know, and I think that Trudeau had has made strides uh, with labor over his time. And certainly, you know, that that was evident, particularly in his last mandate. But there's not a there's not like a cultural or institutional feeling of closeness with labor and with with um, unionized working people. And it comes out in moments like this. Although I will also note that during Biden's speech, the Tories sat on their hands for rounds of applause over unionized jobs, which just seemed like a really weird move to me. But, you know, I think that when it comes to the budget, what we're going to see this week, there's going to be there's going to be good stuff in there. There's going to be like incremental good stuff. Uh, but the messaging is is a mess. Like Freeland was out this weekend still talking about it in terms of fiscal restraint, which we know is not happening, still sounding more worried about inflation than cost of living. And like we've talked about the nuance of, of how framing that really, really matters. Um, and, you know, talking, you know, Canadians right now, like they're feeling feeling the pinch on rate hikes. They're feeling the cost of living going up there, you know, those who have variable rate mortgages, you know, now it's it's like over half of people defaulting now in Ontario, they're millennials. And it's, it's CERB repayments, it's mortgages, it's all it's student debt, all of this coming to a crescendo for people. And I think that the real risk is, is really in the messaging for the liberals, because they're sounding worried about all the wrong problems and not mm. about what people are actually living. So that disconnect, I think, is uh, maybe even more than a missed opportunity for them on the budget. It could be really risky. 
And I think that the fact, you know, like you really did see that contrast between Trudeau and Biden and, and their level of comfort and how they spoke about union jobs and how central it is to the messaging of their whole industrial policy plan. And uh, I, yeah, Trudeau and, and the government, they're just not there yet. And it's, uh, it's oh, a wait, lot. don't let, don't wait, 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 wait. When I said, I said more than politicians in Canada. Like, I heard more about unions from Biden than I do from Jagmeet Singh. Right? Yeah, I think that that's also true. Yeah. yeah. But that's or, also, or I Mer- think, or Merritt Styles or any. Yeah, like, that's also a different. reflection, though, <laughs> I think, of how Biden is talking about the IRA, how he's using that as a political tool. And we don't have that same conversation happening in Canada, which I think I think is a mistake. I think that there's great ground there to be had to be talking about an industrial policy that's first and foremost policy about good family sustaining jobs. And that in the back is towing a whole train of climate action, but nobody has really taken up that space yet. Well, uh, the, the, one of the, like the major theme of the Ontario provincial government was measures around labor and unions and, and putting forward another yeah, $225 then, million dollars to, for union train, union led training programs. Sure. So, and then you stepped yeah. on, you know, and then, and then Ford stepped on his own story by canceling the sick leave. Like, so, you know, I think there's vulnerability. Uh, said, no, the, 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 the sick leave was a pandemic measure. And that and that faded as it should have. That, but that that's is not, not how that, a lot of work that is. Like that is that. well, that's a lot. Maybe public sector, but there's a reason why. And I think Coletto had a a, a poll out recently around this, looking at where party support is from private sector unions. Yeah. And Polyev is far and away leading uh, in that. And and the NDP, who traditionally had those those voters, are third and a more, distant third. More cultural than economic in uh, it's, yeah, well, sure. but it's Absolutely. but you're seeing you're seeing, you know, uh, provinces, you know, being led by Ontario, who, you know, they're why do we win seats in, in Windsor? We won because we're getting a lot of support uh, from union folks. What, what I'll be looking for in the budget, though, which I think, you know, there could be a, a budget day surprise. And if it's around uh, tax hikes and uh, scooping retained earnings from small businesses, et cetera, I think, you know, that could be very newsworthy. And 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 if I were to say if there's one thing that would would cause the conservatives to lead on on the budget, it would be. Uh, anything around taxes, like because I think that's a bread and butter issue for them, and 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 they'd want to take the conversation there, and I think have a lot of support from uh, from uh, from small, the small business community if if it does go that direction. Yeah, if I was them, I just simply wouldn't rise to the bait on the budget. There's going to be a number of things in there that will be individually popular. Dental care will be popular, but as Scott Reed t- taught me many many years ago, you can't communicate something if there's no conflict about it. So I just wouldn't create conflict about it. I would just let it go and, well, and and focus. But I want to get back to this union thing because I think there's something important here that maybe parties in Canada need to pick up on, which is there's something about union jobs that specifies the type of job you're talking about, a security, a level of compensation, a safety net of benefits, etc., that people don't necessarily associate with jobs anymore. Like we have the lowest unemployment rate in modern Canadian history. It's so low that everybody's demanding that we bring people in to fill jobs. And yet governments are not popular about this because having a job, creating jobs, isn't the same shorthand that it was 30 years ago. Right. Because people can imagine that those jobs are not jobs they would want to have or not jobs that are in there. So there's something I think I assume that Biden is appealing to constituencies. The union movement's more important in democratic politics than it is in Canadian politics, but also that he's using it as a way to signify Mm -hmm. that these are not your run of the mill delivery person or warehouse jobs, that these are real jobs like we used to know them. Even the I NDP. think there's something really important of, about what Biden is doing there is that he's he's speaking to an idea of what the good life can be for millennial Americans, right? In, in right, a way that we right. we haven't we haven't coalesced that conversation in Canada, and I think that there's maybe not as there maybe we're not um, we're not the inheritors of quite so much inherent hope about that, <laughs> and and so that conversation hasn't happened here. But I, I want to you know just to come back to what you're saying, David, like. And I and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on the the sick leave example in Ontario because I think it's telling, you know. Yeah, 
it's possible that unionized workers won't really care about that because most of them have sick leave guaranteed by their job. But guess who doesn't? Like only one in 10 precarious workers in Ontario has some form of paid sick leave. So by so canceling it is really go, you know, is, is going to be punishing those folks. And I think that there's a, a gap in Canada when we talk about workers and when we talk about appealing to workers as voters with with the constituency of private and public sector unionized workers, but then the working class, right? And and we've talked a little bit before about how today's working class is not, this is not just blue collar jobs at a factory, white guys with lunch buckets. This is overwhelmingly young, racialized, female and service industry focused. And there continues to be a gap, I think, from all parties about how to speak to those voters in a compelling way that rallies around their hopes for a better future. And I think that we we see in what Biden is doing a little bit more closing of that that rhetorical gap. Well, you're seeing you're seeing measures uh, aimed at those those folks. So, for instance, like in Ontario, the extension of uh, minimum wage to gig workers uh, is like a good example of, of targeting those folks. But the bigger policy lever that I think you're seeing uh, all the parties federally uh, and most of the parties provincially and, and especially in Ontario and in, in British Columbia uh, is uh, around housing affordability. And uh, that, you know, if you're looking for, for, for vote drivers for millennials and new Canadians, uh, it doesn't get any bigger uh, than the housing issue. It's, if you could, uh, it's Corey, really... the, conundrum is, the conundrum is having something understandable yeah, that sounds like it might make a difference, right? I mean, it's it sits well, there as a huge issue. It would dominate it if somebody could nail it. Well, but well, how do you nail it? Well, you know, we we talked about wanting to have a million and a half more uh, housing units built. And if you look around... Uh, 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 Toronto, uh, the the number of cranes you see in the sky uh, that are building uh, building additional housing, like it's it's uh, you know it's it's slacked off a little bit because of interest rate hikes. I think uh, we're probably going to only do about eighty thousand uh, houses this year in Ontario, as opposed to what we'd like, which is more like one hundred and fifty thousand. But you know that that's you know being stalled out a little bit because of of interest rates and things like that. But you got to have some aspirational targets, and at the end of the day, uh, much like you know, fixing healthcare things, uh, the, the you know the the uh, the truth is in what actually ends up happening. Are you actually are people seeing more housing in the market, and uh, you know, and is this, the situation getting better? It's like for healthcare, you know, what are the wait times at ER? You know, there are, there are general indicators that will show that you're either moving in that direction or not. But also what you're talking about, what you're focusing on, like, are you talking about the problem and are you talking about it in terms that people can relate to? Um, so, you know, uh, where the government have done more poorly on this is, say, you know, stuff around the green belt where people aren't seeing an association between the policy and the outcome. Uh, but where they're doing better is, is you know, when you're you're talking about. Uh, you know, uh, actually speeding up approvals and getting more housing built that way. So, like, there there are examples of it being communicated well and and less well. But I, I think that is uh, you know the largest issue if we're talking about you know how do we make millennials feel you know listened to and more a part of the conversation. Maybe I'll, I'll just say one quick thing. I, I think it is interesting that the word union got dropped from political vernacular, even with new Democrats uh, somewhere over the course of the last 30 years. Uh, now there are political coalition issues in the United States for Democrats that, you know, the institutional power of unions with an uppercase U that, that also alter it and why it's, it's part of their vernacular a little bit more, but here it's, it's been run away from actively run away from. And so when you see conservative politicians like Doug Ford appealing, they talk about workers and they talk about good paying jobs. And so do the liberals and even so do the new Democrats, people, sort of shy away from saying the word union and using it as a sword, David, in the way that you talked about, which is to say, I'm going to be an advocate for unions because union jobs mean, by definition, baked in what my mom, who was a member of the CAW working at, at what was called Northern Electric at the time, what my mom understood to mean right? That somebody had her back, right? That she would have a pension, that there would be disability. And my mom did go down with disability in her forties and that, you know, you get a decent higher level of pay and that somebody would be there every three years fighting. Now you might have to throw some money in a strike fund and take some risks, 
But that's what union meant. I got a fucking union job. When you were living in Belleville, Prince Edward County, Hastings County, when I was a kid, and you got a job at Northern Electric, you said you got a union job. And that wasn't like a dirty phrase. That wasn't like, oh, one of those fucking public sector union jobs. It was like, I got a union job. And that meant I'm covered, man. I make a higher dollar amount per hour and I'm covered. If I get sick, I'm not shit out of luck. And when I retire... And by the way, I started when I was 24, so I might be able to retire when I'm 58. I'm going to have a good fucking pension. All of that has been lost. And I, I don't know that if we're talking about repatriating manufacturing, that that has to remain lost. I, I think maybe that sword could be unsheathed again. Me well, too. But, uh, like I, I, you are seeing, you know, uh, like I'll, I'll disagree in the case of Ford. He uses union all the time. Like, and in the budget, union stuff is front and center, like very deliberately so. And if I were to say, what what category of event has Ford done more of in the last you know three years than any other category, it would be stuff with unions, whether it's Leuna or IBW or Carpenters or you name it. Like um, all of them, all of them, uh, the Unifor. The Ford Monty McNaughton offensive continues. It does. Yeah. All right. Hey, yous. Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. I can go well, first. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Do it. Okay. My hey you is to Jignit Singh and the New Democrats. I think that uh, fairly rightly, I think folks are feeling like they had a pretty good week last week by breaking the log jam and getting Katie Telford uh, on the hook to testify at committee on the election interference issue. But my hey you is this. Do not be fooled. This is not an issue that has any resonance off the hill. So don't dwell on it. Uh, take the win. Do what you need to do at that committee. But really stay focused on the affordability, on the job stuff. Use the budget. You've got looks like you've got some really good wins coming. Um, don't miss that space. Do not be fooled. Very good. Wise advice, I say. Who's up? I can go next. Uh, I'm going to just build on what we were just talking about. My hey you is to Peter Bethlen Favi. Uh, a great budget, I think. You know, you uh, have a path to balance uh, investment in labor and immigration, uh, stuff in critical minerals, trying to bring manufacturing back to southwestern Ontario. This is all really good stuff. So, uh, hey you, Peter, great budget. Excellent. Scott? Uh, you kind of touched on it earlier. You hinted at it, David. Uh, may he use uh, Canadian American Business Council in Canada 2020. You guys threw a great party the other night. I got to hang around with uh, Alan Doyle, Alan Hocko, Mark Critz, the whole <laughs> Newfoundland mafia there and drink beer and have fun. And uh, so, you know, I um, Ottawa sort of treats me like Roberto Duran, right? It kind of remembers me for all the fights I lost and thinks of me as uh, washed up and maybe deservedly. So and I wrote a, I kind of wrote. Oh, but you book. had a heart, man. You had a heart. Uh, but, uh, but, but they were kind enough to steal out of the charity that, uh, that, that motivates them to, to, to toss an invite. So I had fun at that party and I appreciated the time. Excellent. I was there too. It was lots of fun. I appreciate my invite too. My hey you goes out to the mayor of Regina. She, and I emphasize she, unveiled a tourism campaign for Regina that was so juvenile that I'm surprised I didn't come up with it. Um, a city that does not need to give people more reason to make fun of it. Just gave people years worth of jokes and not one more tourist. Well done. All right. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsors, CN Rail, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, and the Nuclear Innovation Institute. I'd like to thank everybody who watched and listened, the three of you for being here with me, obviously. And, uh, and well, uh, you know, Joe Biden for a good time. Uh, so without any further ado, that's it for this week. And we'll see you next week with more Curse of Politics. Well, actually, we'll see you Thursday with more Curse of Politics. So look out for a bonus edition this week, later on. Okay, see you later. Bye.